Hello, and welcome to Codex Rex. My name is Dux. And my name is Tyler. And we both are your hosts, but the, this time I am the main host and Tyler is the co-host. Tyler, what is Codex Rex about? What do we do here? So this is a video game history podcast uh, where each episode, one of us writes a story about something culturally important or historically important in video game history. Or perhaps we just look through the history of a video game series and how it became what it was or what kind of impact it has on the industry. And so one of us comes in with a story that the other one has not heard and we talk about it as we go. Yeah. And what we usually do is we, 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 we have some banter and um, then we get right into it. But first we have to do the banter part. So I'm going to ask you, what have you been up to recently? Well, we haven't had an episode in a while, and that is like 90% my fault because I recently moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. It's a very long story there, and it sucked up uh, pretty much a huge portion of my focus and time. So while well, I'm much happier out here, except for the fact that there's deadly <laughs> terrible smog flying through the air right now, you know, and like burned pine needles. Yeah, so not only is there a terrible pandemic ravaging the united states everything's also on fire out here so cool. um but yeah so that's that's what i've been up to in my personal life um in my video game slash board gaming life i recently got back into warhammer 40k i have a ton of models that i used to paint long ago like a decade ago and when i moved out here a buddy of mine and i decided we wanted to get back into 40k because he purchased a 3d printer and we can print things now, which is very exciting. So you print your own figures now? Yes. So <clears throat> he's in the early stages of basically calibrating the machine, but he's been showing me test results. And so uh, you can go online and find all kinds of different minis that would fit right into an army and print them out at a pretty high level of detail, paint them as if you would the regular models. So that's been really exciting to go and look for things that we have always wanted or cool models that we need yeah. things like that. 3d printing is such a cool technology it really is yeah there's just like the practical applications even outside of painting miniatures are really fascinating to me so right. but yeah i've just been doing i've just been doing a lot of that in my free time it's just painting things it's been very exciting that's cool yeah i've been i've, I've started like I, I noticed that i'm I, I get 30 soon and sometimes i start to breathe heavily while walking up the stairs and <laughs> I felt like if I don't want to die of a heart attack at 40, I got to do something about that. So I started running two weeks ago and I got myself a smartwatch and um, because I'm really bad at like not overworking myself and right. that that watch is coaching me and it does it really well, but still I am in constant pain right now because everything hurts all the time and that's what I'm doing right now. And video game wise, I'm playing RimWorld. I discovered RimWorld for myself. And uh, I've been playing it all the time, trying to create a cannibal cult that eats all the people around the world. It's really fun. Uh, as soon as I saw that you and a bunch of other people in the community were playing RimWorld, I slapped it on my wish list because I was like, ooh, this looks like something that I could get totally sucked into and ruin my life with. So yeah. let's not do that right now. <laughs> but when let's it gets on either. sale, maybe. <laughs> maybe when it's a cheap way to ruin my life. Yeah. One thing we could get into is um, if one would like to talk to one of us or interact with one of us, how we could get in contact with them. And you, one could meet by just joining your Twitch channel, which is yep. twitch.tv slash Tyler. Vegan, uh, vegan, vegan, <laughs> vegan Tyler. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I have a Twitch channel as well with, on which I don't hang out as much, but I hang out in your Discord a lot. You so do. if one would join your Discord channel, um they could um i i'm, I'm i pre basically live there so one could yeah yeah you me. that's pretty much you basically how did you describe it you came in and started uh just put rubbing your face on everything or something yeah. like that it smells like me now that's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so i so this is one of my side projects obviously um i'm normally on twitch my current schedule is Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'm on twitch.tv slash vegan Tyler. You could also, if you wanted to, shoot me an email at vegan Tyler TTV at gmail.com if you have any questions about either the stream or this podcast. 
uh, in the future, I will probably set up a specific account specifically for the podcast if that becomes something that people need or they want to ask questions or shoot me topic ideas. Uh, I've got a yeah, whole list a of them idea. built. But yeah, so if you ever want to suggest an idea for a podcast, sh- shoot uh, shoot me an email at vegantylerttv at gmail.com. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. So, yeah, that and sounds also, great. also, let's get into the episode now. Yeah, let's jump right into it. You got for me today man okay we're going to talk about something that we've been talking about the last year with us too and that is an actual group of video game developers and we're going to talk about one certain person his name is peter douglas molyneux and this story is going to be about how he became a video game developer so while researching this episode just as a heads up i came across something that you mentioned before And that is that if you read interviews by people that have been a developing team, that for some reason, they always depict themselves as the ones that did most of the work. Of course. So in this story, I came over a lot of stuff where I was like, this, this guy claims to have developed this, but I read like one hour before this, I read something by another guy that also said he did that. So I decided to just stay impartial about that and not make like not be the judge of who is bullshitting and who is not. And maybe they just they just forgot. Sure. Time is difficult. And I'm just like sometimes I'm gonna refer to them as the whole group because they all said they did it. And just to be fair to them. Sure, that's fine. What I also must say is that the group we're gonna talk about that they didn't do it in a mean way. Like they always said, I did everything and they did nothing. They always kept um, putting each other in a good light. And I really like that about them. So this was really a group that stuck together as friends because they wanted to succeed as developers. So this just as a little heads up about what this is going to be about. But I want you to have like a grain of skepticism about what I'm going to tell you now, because these guys are going to be a bit weird. So let's get into it. Well, I mean, yeah, these guys are going to be a bit weird could apply to literally any game development story that we do (laughs) they they always turn out to be weirdos that's kind of yes the gist of it okay peter molyneux he was born in 1959 and he was the son of a toy shop owner he grew up in guildford guildford is a suburb of london it's kind of southeast south west of london okay the young peter would according to himself he'd play with anthills in the forest and you know, when little boys play with ant health, they like put sticks into it and they break stuff by the ants and then they watch the ants um, panicking and um, carrying of their corpses into the uh, out of the <laughs> ant hill. And he, he kind of played God in a way with this ant hill. And, and he would be fascinated by the power that he felt, but he'd also feel regret. And he would kind of describe it as a game plays itself like okay. a, a simulation of sorts and of course it was just a cool boys game but this is going to be important for for what he's going to make later on because this power is something that was going to stay with them this feeling of power and this feeling of a game that is exciting just to watch so fast forward out of peter's childhood into 1984 he is 25 years old now and i mean 25 is like the age all great minds reveal themselves right yes peter was currently selling um floppy disks <laughs> so he wasn't a great mind yet um <laughs> he was selling floppy disks for the commodore 64. Ooh, and, okay yeah it was kind of was the gaming platform at the moment and to improve his sales he would 
copy games onto the floppy disks. Because if you want to sell a floppy disk, it, they would sell easier if you had you could say like, oh, there's a video game on here. You can play it as well. Try it out. Maybe it's fun. And then you also have a floppy disk to do stuff with. And hmm. okay. at, some, at some point, you kind of figured out that the people just bought the floppy disks for the games and not for the floppy disks anymore. So he kind of turned into a video game salesman for a while. And that was interesting to him. And he also, he was a huge video game nerd. He had a Commodore 64 himself. He'd like to play it. He had a few games he really liked. And he was pretty knowledgeable about current video game culture. And so he also heard about these one person developers, these people that sat in little chambers and they wrote a game by themselves and then they sell it. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden they turn into these millionaires, these rich right. people. And he was like, dude, yeah, I can do that. And I mean, so <laughs> think about um, the guy who made Undertale, Toby Fox. Yeah. That guy made the entire game down to like character models, um, you know, all of the writing, all of the uh, all the music, everything, and I think for him, I was I, he. They recently had their five year anniversary, which is why this came to mind mm -hmm. um, of when the game came out. It was like a really surreal experience for him when it was like music he made in twenty minutes, and a game maker was being performed by an orchestra, and he was just like, "Huh, this is really strange to me, right?" Dude, like Megalomania is one of the yeah. um, greatest video game tracks. There is. And yeah cool. so yeah um peter has exactly that feeling yeah i can do this on my own i can be one of these guys and i can i can be a rich developer i can and mostly i think it was a lot about being rich and famous because sure. he was a young man so he started making a game it was kind of a text-based business simulation for the commodore 64 and he called it entrepreneur like the small business owner sure. and it actually also was about running a small company. And Peter was convinced that this text-based game, it was going to be a huge success. So <laughs> okay. he, he took out advertising. Yes, there's a very, go ahead. It's a huge market for that kind of game, you know? Yes. There's text. A, it's, it's, <laughs> if I get text-based business simulation, I get, my, I get my money out and I start throwing it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, do you know how many games I have pre-ordered right now? And the keywords are text-based business simulator <laughs> okay but you gotta say this was um this was much <laughs> earlier in gaming history this was like 1982 of course games were still different but still text-based business simulation was not common at the time absolutely sure but he, what he did he was he took out advertisement space in a video game magazine he actually paid for it from, from his own money um, so people could actually they see his telephone number or they see his address and they could send him a letter to order a video game, old school, you know. And sure. he used his own funds to create hundreds of this game, hundreds of copies on, on floppy disks, which he had enough of because he was selling them. And he knew that any day now, because he finished this game, any day now, his post box would be flooded with orders and he'd be a rich man. Sure. Yes, the, the poor guy. You know, bank bank your whole life on the, yeah, the, the on the business simulator. <laughs> the dude was set up for disappointment. It was, <laughs> reading it, it, was, it almost made me cry. And after he <laughs> finished the game, how how do, how many do you think that he sold? Okay, I'm gonna say seven copies. It's less. He sold two, <laughs> two copies, <laughs> and he is convinced. He said that in an interview. He's convinced he sold two <laughs> copies, and he thinks one of his was bought by his mom <laughs> <laughs> of course of course thanks mom this really makes I, me feel better <laughs> you know i think you have to temper expectations on certain projects like i always joke about my dissertation and i'm like the only people who are actually going to read my dissertation are my fiance and my mother the committee is going to skim it and go yeah whatever and yeah. no one else is ever going to care <laughs> That seems like a dissertation. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> but your mom's going to be very proud. That's good. She mom's, will. Mom's always she, do that. My mom can't remember what I study, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, I bet that'll be a fun paper for her to read. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, so Peter Molyneux, he was he was crushed, right? He had these huge expectations. And this experience had ruined him. So he gave up his video game development dreams entirely. He just went, oh. fuck it, I'm out of this. 
So and that's the end of the story. That's, that's it. the end of the story. That's um, our episode. That's done. <laughs> Boom. Another one in the bank. Codex Rex, baby. <laughs> done. Take yeah. that. No, we're gonna, you know what? With this episode, we're going to take the podcasting world by storm. Orders are going to be coming in. Yeah, let's make the post books a bit bigger because this is going <laughs> to break it. <laughs> okay, now he actually, he what he what he started doing is he started ha having a normal job. Now, and it's not, not, not too much of a normal job, but he had a job. He started working in an office, a tiny little office, as he describes it, in Guildford, the um, suburb mm -hmm. he's living in. And he describes this office as straight from a horror story. Oh. Um, he, because he worked on the second floor of this apartment building. And on the first floor below, floor below his office lived this old lady. And apparently this lady would never leave the house and she'd do these weird screeches all day that sounded like her hemorrhoids were eating up from inside and and i mean you might be able to relate to to, yeah. to living close to neighbors that Ooh. never stay silent and he lived in that in his office all day oh that's just terrible um and what's interesting is what his was it what his office work was about he kind of when he created these hundreds of copies for his game, he met this dude who is going to be important. He's called Les Edgar, Les like Leslie. Mm -hmm. And um, Les worked in this computer outlet store and they had these Tandy machines. I don't know, Tandy machines, they were kind of used to create copies of floppy disks. That's what they did. Yep, I know Tandy machines. Yeah. Uh, weirdly, I know Tandy machines because they used to make references to them on Homestar Runner. <laughs> Oh, pretty cool. So. Yeah, and I never heard the term before. Maybe it's because there's a different term in German. That's okay. But um, yeah, he he like um, he came to a store. He was like, I need to make a hundred copies of my game. That's going to be a huge success. And Les Edgar was like, you 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 like they instantly connected. Like, oh, yo, you make games. That's so cool. Like two young dudes um, finding out like they're the only nerds in the world, and they're like, oh nice, mm -hmm. someone else I can talk to about the bullshit I think about all day. So they became <laughs> instant friends, and after entrepreneur was kind of a failure they decided to, to to make their own company because they still were super bored with their life and they kind of wanted to move on and he was working this outlet store les edgar and he was like oh i gotta, I gotta do something else so they founded a company and they called it taurus impex limited that's what okay. it was called and what they did because Peter had some business connection for some reason, some private business connection. They sold baked beans into the Middle East. What? Yeah, that's what they did. They sold baked beans okay. into the Middle East. They, I don't, they never explained why. That's just what they always reference to. It's like they did that for a while. <laughs> okay. I need clarification here before I start riffing on whatever this was. What baked beans Was are. this... Well, <laughs> what are... <laughs> I have, I have an important question for you. What are baked beans? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> baked beans? I don't know. They're not a German thing, but I think they're these beans in aluminum cans, and they are <laughs> stuck in this greasy sauce, and you eat them for breakfast in England a lot. Yeah. But do you, so wait, you, you you have baked beans in Germany, right? You're not just fucking with me. Like, we have baked beans, but we don't I assumed. <laughs> How do you not have baked beans? Okay. I don't know. I don't know what it's like over there. In Germany, we mostly eat sauerkraut all the time. Oh, uh, that does that does fit with what I've heard. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. So their company was founded as a video game company, or no. just they wanted to make a company. They just wanted to make a company. They wanted to be entrepreneurs. They wanted to be oh. businessmen, and they had no clue where to be businessmen in. So they were like, "That's I like Peter knew this guy. Like I think the father of his girlfriend had a business connection to the Middle East." And also they kind of had a relation to someone that produced baked beans. So they turned into the middleman. Like I can, I can handle the expert business for you. Okay. And I, they just did that. That, and for them, that sounded better than just being, um, wage slaves. You know, I, I, I'd like to poke fun here because of the absurdity of selling baked beans to the middle East as a 20 something job. <laughs> but you know what, man, like, if you're thinking about like your job was to go and put floppy disks into the Tandy machine, I mean, yeah, that probably sounds like a pretty good upgrade, right? I think so too. I think it actually. I think it's a sensible decision. And yeah, 
they called it Taurus Impex Limited because they both were Taurians, the zodiac sign. Oh, okay. And so they had this company, they sold baked beans to the Middle East. That didn't really work super well because I, it's selling baked beans to the Middle East. So what they did most of the time is sit alone in that office, eat cold baked beans out of aluminum cans and listen to old lady screeches from downstairs. And that does sound like a horror movie. It is, yeah. And th but they did make enough money to get by. Okay. And it, it was an okay life. And at this point, it might be interesting what Peter had to say about how becoming a video game developer again came to be. And he says, it's really a tale of development born out of slightly my incompetence and slightly good luck. So in, this is the part of the story where the luck sets in for the first time. And this is going to be insane. Okay. So while working at his <clears throat> Taurus office, he received a call from Commodore. The, okay. Yeah, the, the, the Commodore. They who, said, we want 6,000 copies of Entrepreneur right now. Oh, wait. <laughs> the business text world is taking the fuck off. Your dream's here, Peter. It's coming to knock it. Open the door. <laughs> no, it was Commodore. And, you know, Commodore at the time, they were in control of the home, of the, of the home computer market during the time. And as we know, okay. Pete, Peter himself, he owned a Commodore. He was a Commodore mm -hmm. fanboy. He loved it. He was an avid video game fan. And he was excited about the call, and they claimed to have heard of the company. They heard of Taurus Impex Limited, which the baked bean company. Yeah, yeah. It, he he was just as confused. He was like, "Okay, why, why would they know a company that exports baked beans?" What? Okay. So he was like, "Anyway, okay." And they invited him to come to their headquarters for a day so they could show him around and talk about their new products the amiga 1000 they were just producing the amiga 1000 their new big product and he was like yeah sure I, i'm gonna come to your headquarters and look at your stuff i don't <laughs> i don't agree so he and les they came by and they were shown around the factory and led into some kind of conference room and at in the conference room <laughs> they were offered 10 brand new Amiga 1000 consoles machine under the condition that they would develop software products for the Amiga 1000. If you guys could see my face right now, my <laughs> jaw is just on the floor. How? Like what series of events led to them calling this dude? <laughs> it gets better. So it was, it was the same, like software products? Uh, <laughs> We ex like the, the, he knew like we export beans. We don't make software products. <laughs> they, they had no software product. Entrepreneur was nothing. And yeah. <laughs> so, so this is when Peter remembered something, and that is that there's another company called Taurus, just written slightly different. Oh no! <laughs> and they actually produced software solutions for network and stuff. And um, obviously, <laughs> the people of, of Commodore, they believe that they actually invited the software producer Taurus instead oh. of the beam exported Taurus. So, oh my so God. Dude, so you, you're sitting in this conference room <laughs> and you're like, oh, what, what do I do now? And you're young <laughs> and you get offered a piece of technology that will cost a fortune uh -huh. in a few months, what it get released, and they want to give it to you for free because they oh, think man. you are someone else. And according to Peter, he actually he had a can of baked beans with him in his in his bag. And he for a short time he thought about just getting it out, explaining the story. They all <laughs> had a mighty laugh, it's gonna be really funny, and then they'd all move right. on with their lives. But he didn't do it. He, That's the right play. He he lied. <laughs> he just went with it, and like he said, we just we just agreed, and we left as fast as we could. <laughs> just just stopped up and disappeared. So a few weeks later, they, they get a shipment of ten fresh Amiga One Thousand machines into their office. That is fucking unbelievable. <laughs> but but now they were under this. That now, now they had this condition on top of them, like you got to make software for us. Uh huh. Because but you know I'm what I'm thinking about in relevant times is like when COVID hit and uh, Zoom started to basically take over the meeting market, yeah. and there was some other company, some little startup called like Zoom 
products or something and their <laughs> stock shot up like eight thousand percent in a day because people were like the fuck them. we gotta buy zoom right now and they're like okay i guess all right <laughs> It's exactly the same. Just the lucky yep. name call. Um, so yeah, they knew like, oh man, Commodore keeps calling us, but we suck at making software. We, we have no clue. I mean, we like to play video games, but what else can we do? And Peter and Edgar, they both got pretty stressed out by this. So they had to self-teach how to develop. Because, okay. because now they were in this deal. They had to make software for Commodore. And together they create, they actually create a piece of software for the Amiga 1000. They just do it. And it was called Entrepreneur 2. No, they didn't make a game. Okay. Because Commodore was convinced that the Amiga 1000 was not going to be gaming hardware. It was going to be, oh, okay. it, it was going to be business hardware. That was the whole gist of the machine. They thought they were going to sell it to companies and they could do their accounting on it. Because it was, a, huh. it was a, I mean, it's a computer, it's a calculating machine. And they made a business software that was called Acquisition. I have something relevant. So do you remember when we talked about in our first episode about Sega? Yeah. This was really common at the time to create gaming consoles that did other stuff. So like all of Sega's consoles in, in that era had like peripherals that would do things like answer your phone for you and stuff or like what's an answer your phone like it had like an answering machine built in or you could get like you know little things that would do calculations or whatever so like my guess is that there was kind of like um they were trying to push that market because the, the gaming market wasn't diff the gaming market was different back then than yeah. it is today like we think of gaming as a thing right but they they wanted like all in one sort of consoles that could do stuff. So I'm not surprised. I also think that the business niche was still free for the taking. So everybody right. poked into it all the time. Like maybe yeah. we get into it. Maybe we get into it. Maybe we get into it. and it took a while before it was filled up with companies that sure. were established. So yeah, they make this they make this business software called Acquisition that is kind of about accounting and they completely because they are salesmen they completely overhyped it they were like this is the ultimate database for the amiga 1000 and it was actually written on the title the ultimate database you can do this and it was absolutely oh not gosh. it was terrible and during all the interviews with these guys you can always kind of see that these dudes came came from a sales background and sure. they knew how to make a product look like something it was not right and development wise, Peter and Edgar, they, they had no clue what they were doing, but they finished developing acquisition, which is pretty big. And, mm -hmm. and they also sold it. They made some money with it. So um, let's hear a quote from Edgar about exactly that time. And Edgar says, life was good. The bank was happy. We were drunk, at least until the first 200 page fax containing bugs and problems arrived on our desk. Turns out that in real life, as against our simplistic testing, real people tried to use the software with real data in commercial situations and it didn't work. Oh. So after spending all of our money in fixing bugs and issuing a 50 page amendment to the manual, we had to question mm. our future as commercial software developers. So they were just crushed again. They developed something. They had this deal with Commodore and it, it just didn't work out. They just made shitty software and everybody knew it. And that sucks. So now we have reached 1987. Okay. And at this point, Amiga was coming to the realization, oh, maybe, maybe we're not going to be a business software after all. And Peter and Edgar also realized that as well. Maybe we don't want to be business business developers. Maybe we want to be game developers because we obviously fucked up the business part. And right. Edgar had no clue how to make games. Peter had no clue how to make games. And he also had no confidence because he was like, Peter was crushed in the game development department already. Right. But this is where, where, where Fortuna smiled upon them again. Because luck, luck is important for this story. They get these guys get hyper lucky all the time. So these guys they went to a pub a lot, and this pub is called Drummonds. And Drummonds is going to be a, also like it's it's one of the main sceneries of this entire story. They always, whenever 
They, they were bored and didn't know what to do. Peter always says, pubs and any kind of office work, they went hand in hand. If you could mm -hmm. not stand sitting in your office chair anymore, you would go to the pub and share a pint, talk about work and such. And so Drummond's was just down the street. They'd walk down the office, go down the street, and, and they'd be there all the time. And of course, by now, people around Guildford, they knew that Peter and Edgar, they were sitting on these Amiga machines. And they knew that they were doing some kind of development work because you talk in the pub and it just spread around. And sure. one day this dude came up to them and asked them, yeah, do you have any experience in creating video games? Especially because you have these Amiga 1000s, right? Because this guy knew these two other guys that actually made a game called Enlightenment Druid 2. I don't know where what, what okay. I don't know what happened to Enlightenment Druid One, but apparently it was only Enlightenment Druid Two, and they developed this game when they were twelve years old, quite a few years ago, and now they want it converted to a modern, like, current platform, the Amiga One Thousand. They wanted what to was it Enlightenment Druid about? It was an RPG. Uh, oh. I don't. What, You're yet. a druid seeking enlightenment. A apparently, the second time. I I have not done a lot of research on that, but they were asked if they would um, convert that to the Amiga. Sure. Uh, and th they were asked if they had video game development experience because that would what that would be what you would need to convert a game, and they were like, "Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> 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 Peter, Peter, <laughs> silently, Peter silently tucks the can of baked beans back into the bag. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh huh. I, can, I got you, dude. I can make it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, they were they were thinking about making video games already, and they they decided to just roll with it. They just be this is the perfect opportunity. This is an open door. Let's just pretend that we can do this, and then we'll figure it out. So, so they took the job, and and they also they they really needed the money, and they got help from another young man who's going to be the final of the three. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just cannot quit laughing about the, the fact that people keep coming up to him and being like, "Hey, you're that guy who can do that, right?" And he's like, "You fucking bet I am." <laughs> I'm that guy. Yeah, dude, fake, fake it till you make it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, so this other guy that they 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 found him uh, probably in Drummond's pub. I don't know. He was called okay. Glenn Corps, and okay. he was he was more proficient in software development than the other two, than Les and Peter, and he converted most of the graphics for Druid Two. Okay. So the entire Amiga port that they actually did, it took them half a year, for which they got paid £4,000. And I looked it up how much £4,000 would be today, and it would be about $15,000, okay. which, which is a good amount of money for half a year of work, but still is not a lot of money for half a year of work. Yeah, especially when you're splitting it. Yeah, especially if it's not fifteen thousand dollars just for you, but it's fifteen thousand yeah. dollars for three guys that live in a filthy office. Yeah, but at least that money they didn't have to reinvest into the game again, which they had to do for all the money they got for acquisition. All the money they got for acquisition that they did before, they just had to put back into the software because they it was so bad and they had to fix all fix all the bugs. <clears throat> That's a common theme that we've seen with some of the the game developers we talked about is that like they would make money. And then they would immediately reinvest it back into their next project to try and get big. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of, I think it's kind of rare, not that this is what happened to them, but I think, it, I think it's kind of rare early on for companies to not do that. Yeah. And also, like, but, but you got to admit that this is, this is a pretty fragile cycle, right? If mm -hmm. you, if making your next project depends on the money you make from your last project, that is um, a time bomb um, that can horribly fail you right so some of some of you who know me from the stream know that one of my greatest angers uh of the gaming industry is that they were supposed to make three chrono trigger games and they made chrono cross and then they trademarked chrono break and they never made chrono break and i am a total chrono trigger chrono cross fanboy and there's so many things that i want resolution on that they're never going to make because Chrono Cross was such a deviation from their previous work that 
you know, it just it didn't sell like they wanted. It wasn't it wasn't the kind of game that they wanted, which maybe, you know, we'll do an episode on that someday. But like I I hate it. And it's because, you know, each game in a series or each thing that developers do influences later things that they do, which makes sense. It's part of your portfolio, right? So anyway, um, I think that that's common and it does cause some casualties along the way, you know, of what might have been. But that's just my side note and my I'm yeah, going to take, my so, take my soapbox about the Chrono, the Chrono Trigger series <laughs> and just kick it, kick it back under the desk where it can live until I'm angry yeah, again. But I do so. think that that is a very interesting topic on its own is how video game financing works. And mm-hmm. um, that turns into a problem for many video game developers. So they take these six months they make these games and during this six months that they spend less and Edgar and Glenn, they spend in their office, they get the confidence to, to give video game development in general another go to make a self-made product. So Edgar and Peter and Glenn, they abandon the bean export branch, which they were still doing. They abandon it completely. And they also um, abandoned the name Taurus Impacts Limited. And they rebrand the company to Bullfrog Productions. Okay. You know, Peter Peter can give up the bean business, but he'll never give it up in his heart. Okay. I think I think he'll be a bean seller for the rest of his life. Yeah. What they did, well, why they called it Bullfrog is because in their office, they had a little ornament, a little statue that looked like a bullfrog. And they actually, they just made a logo. Like if you know the bullfrog logo, it's like a super metal cool frog that like looks like a Met, like a poster of a metal band that was not it it was a chubby little frog sitting on a stone the original bullfrog logo and okay you probably know how art in itself is, is like a constant chain of one piece of art influencing another sure. and we, we know that video games are art so they 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 are also kind of a piece of creation and these guys were gamers and they already they they played all kinds of games and they had experiences with other games. So obviously the game that they would make would be influenced by games that they've played already. And one game that they played was a game called Virus by David okay. David Braben. And it was a um, game that was basically you were on this three-dimensional grid of blocks, like a plane landscape. And they were, and you would kind of hover over them with a cursor, and they were okay. fascinated by these block landscapes. And were like, "Can we make this ourselves?" And it was actually one of the first video games that featured 3D in general, um, which was still a rare thing during that time. We are still in 1987. Can I throw yeah? on a side story here before we move on? Yeah, I don't know. This is unconfirmed. I'm going to throw this out there. It's possible that virus may have had a remake in the 90s because a personal story here i remember back in the early days of the internet there was a like a viral marketing campaign where you could download um it was like some program i don't even remember what it was supposed to do yeah and uh, you know like happy fun game dot exe or something and when you would open it <clears throat> it would say are you sure you want to delete your windows directory and you'd go no and as you'd hover your mouse over to no it would move your cursor to yes and you would it would make it look like you accidentally clicked it and then you would have to watch as all of your files were destroyed <laughs> and your pc screen would go black and it would go thankfully it's only a game and it would show you that it was this game i still remember it It i think it was called virus but i could be wrong and what it was is that you were going through your own computer files to fight viruses that had infected your pc with like a zappy gun kind of thing uh but to my great delight as a preteen and young teen was to send this to people and say, check out this really cool game demo. And then they would say, Oh my God, you ruined my computer. You destroyed everything. My mom's going to be so mad. And I'd be like, now nah, you're good, bro. <laughs> and they'd be like, fuck you, Tyler. Why would you do this to me? That's pretty funny. Go, <laughs> that must have been intense. The feeling- so I don't know if that was the same game, but that just, that, that, that story just fell out of my, you know, brain meat here. So the feeling of possibly having broken your parents' computer is oh my god, dude, 
can't describe. Oh my it. god. I remember I wanted to upgrade my mother's computer to have a dedicated graphics card and I put it in and it worked. And then one day while I was off doing something, I couldn't like come home. She called me and told me that the computer was broken. And it was because there was some confliction between the hardware and the software that she was using or something. So she like tore it out of the PC and uh, I was never allowed to install anything again. I don't even know what happened to that graphics card, but just the feeling of dread where I was like, oh my God, I'm dead. Oh, <laughs> like, there's no way I'll survive this. <laughs> okay. Anyway. So the Bullfrog guys, they were fascinated with this game and how it could sure. create landscapes out of squares, out of, of the, out of these blocks. And they wanted to make a game that also featured a 3D map. That was their goal, to create something like that. So they started to create something similar. And while Edgar and Peter um, were still trying to fix a new batch of bugs for acquisition, because they still had to handle that bullshit, right? Glenn, the new guy, he came up with, this, with these isometric blocks that you would kind of look onto from above that had a neat 3D aesthetic about them. And both Peter and Edgar, they found these really cool. And this is one of the parts of the story that I told you about before, where it's really unclear who did what, because P Edgar, as well as Peter, as well as Glenn, they seem to claim this part of the development for themselves. So my guess is they all did it and they just went to Drummond's pub too much. So they okay. were too drunk all the time. They just can't remember, right? Uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm going to be impartial about this and just call them sure. the, the Balfour dudes that did that. While they were experimenting with these new blocks that um, they figured out, they figured out to stick them together to actually form some kind of landscape. And this was still 1988. So they had a 3D landscape game in 1988 where 3D games were not a thing. It, it just didn't yeah. exist. You, you, I mean, they had this one game that they played, but that still looked pretty rough. And this already looked better. They kind of put graphics over it and stuff. And it looked like little meadows and they could make little mountains and raise and lower them and color them too. And this is when they actually learned how to code. Like everything before, they, they had some knowledge about stuff, but they just they just stuck things together and kind of improvised everything. But this is when they really had to know how to code because they were doing this from scratch. They were not porting something that was already existing so they, they could kind of bullshit their way through it. No, they had to do this for real. And what they could make, green hills and gray mountains and blue ocean that actually animated because it would change structure over time. So it looked like it had little waves, which was really cool. And yeah, that sounds really revolutionary for the time period. Dude, yeah, wait for it. Wait for what's coming. And okay. what they were able to do is they were able to make 64 times 64 maps. 64 times 64 blocks, which are pretty big. And each block could be something else, could be a mountain or a slope or a, a little wasteland or something. And But code-wise, these 64 times 64 maps would be three maps on top of each other. And the first maps would just be the blocks. The second map would be what's on the blocks, so which kind of landscape. And the third block would be something like, let's call it the step count. And the step, okay. the step count is important for what's now what's going to come now. And that is, they were able to put objects on the map, 256 objects, it's all, um, all binary numbers. Sure. And these objects would be little pixel people. They could make little people walk on the map. And what the step count did is the people would always go for the block that had the lowest step count. The block would always measure how often it was stepped on and okay. the little person would always go like, okay, what's the closest block with the lowest step count? And so it would seem like the people on the map were actually exploring it because they would always go like, I wasn't there, I'll go there. And it would, and they, oh, that's cool. And they'd run around in a seemingly random pattern, just trying to reach the outer reaches of the map, but they actually didn't. It was an algorithm that looked really neat and they just stared at it. And it was just like the anthill when Peter was a kid, like, oh man. This looks I can't like I can't predict what they're gonna do, but I know how I programmed this, so this is super cool. Right. And it and it fascinated them a lot. And I mean that sounds pretty cool to 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 come up with that and then 
I mean, it's fascinating for me because I don't do programming, but to think how to program these little people to walk around, um, I bet that would be a really good feeling for them when they, you know, hadn't really had success in these type of things before. Yeah, dude, they never did something themselves like that before. They made a database program, which is just another kind of programming. It, it's not right. It's not much easier or something like that. It's just really different. But because they weren't the biggest experts in programming, they ran into some big problems that a real programmer would have been able to solve. For example, they had this pathfinding problem because if these little people, these little pixel people followed these step counts, but for example, weren't allowed to walk through water, but they wanted to get to a tile that's on the other side of the ocean, the pixel person wouldn't know how to go around because that wasn't programmed into the algorithm. It would try to go through I the see. water and get stuck at the water and just stand there. And they were like, uh, how does one solve this? They had no idea. And nowadays, of course, like uh, if if you if you are kind of into programming, you'd be like, yeah, you can just make a wall hugging algorithm. It's kind of a thing you you learn, and you'd be like, and then someone asks you, and how do you do that? I did, I don't know. I just go on the internet and ask someone, and they would give me an example. But they didn't have that. They had no guides, no nothing. They could buy huge like documentation books about the language they were using, which was C but they kind of have to figure it out the moment. They couldn't, they just didn't know how to do it. So, yeah. so I think it, we really take for granted how much we can learn from Professor Google. And, you know, I remember in the Crash Bandicoot episode we did, they talked about buying these books and the books were literally just code and you would have to type in each individual character correctly and it would make a game because that's the, you know, that's the kind of tech we were working with back then. Yeah. I say we as if I was there or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, but people, we that, as people that were doing programming um, right. had to do it that way. And though from a programmer's perspective, the problem that they had was actually relatively easy to solve, but they didn't know how to do it. So what they did, they, they solved the problem differently because they wanted to go on with the game and not get stuck with this stupid problem. Like, it's fine if they get stuck at the ocean. Let's just do a stupid fix. And what they did is they entered a f they, they made a feature that was easier to implement. And that was just if you click on one of the blocks, you could raise and lower them. So if one, oh. if one of the people ran against the ocean, you could click on the water block and you, could, and you would create land. So the um, so the people would walk onto the land and you could get them over the ocean and be done with the bug. And they were right. like, this is pretty cool. Like, this is like a game feature, right? And they were like, yeah, I, I mean, just, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> hey, that's exactly what this is about. So you got to remember, this was only implemented because they weren't able to make, to, cre to create a proper solution for their 40 AI. And playing around with this landscaping technique, they they figured out that this is this is a, an appealing factor of creating a fun game, especially a game that is about creating a 3D landscape. So Bullfrog decided that this 3D landscaping technique would be one of the central features of the game that they would create. And Peter said this about it. I thought this is really nice. This is really fun, just raising and lowering this land. It was only because I couldn't do the wall hugging. I wasn't good enough of a programmer to do the wall hugging. And that was how what was called nippling of the landscape came about. And it was only because of that. And that was really the birth of what I felt was the core of our game. And nippling is how they call the raising and the lowering of the land. Of course. He, he makes a yes. few jokes about that. But I'm, I'm not, Highly technical term. Highly technical term. I'm not going to get yes. into that. Um, so yeah, this was um, going to be Bullfrog's first own game and it was their original idea that the player would be influencing the land and influencing the people. And to further explore these main mechanics, which were the movement of the people and the landscaping, they made it possible to to play on a single map from two different machines because they wanted oh. to they, they wanted to game test the game together they were like oh man it's, it's so annoying that i have to come to your part of the office to 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 punch around with your machine and you have it set up completely differently i hate using like if it's if it's if you use someone else's computer and you're like i don't know where anything is so they right. so they set it up so you could play multiplayer 
and this is still 1987 there wasn't any multiplayer games and, that is bonkers <laughs> and, and, and 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 they just made this because they were like oh this is so much easier to do it was just a tool for them to develop and sure. and then they were playing on these maps together and they were like two players on one map and they started screwing with each other like drowning each other's people and stuff and they were like dude this is fun we got to make this a feature <laughs> as well and then, so I guess it would be what you would you be directly connecting to someone else's computer or would you be connecting to a server that is hosting that particular game? Yeah, they had maybe no, I don't understand the tech enough. They had no internet. They were directly connected via LAN. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Of course, later on when the internet got more prevalent, you could all you you would possibly also be able to connect via the internet. But these guys, they just right, right. connected their machines directly okay, and I played via a, no a local network that they set up. So, so they noticed that this is a really fun feature that they implemented in this game. And they were like, well, this is a competitive aspect that we just put into this game. And this is going to be, this is, this is definitely also going to be in this. So now they had a game that could do several things. They had landscaping that could be tampered with, which was just a bug fix that, bug fix that they did. They had multiplayer, which was just a development tool that they came up with out of um, necessity and they they had people that constantly moved around following the these the step count mechanic which was which which looked really nice and also the people could could go in numbers they kind of reproduce and they they could animate them and stuff like that and here well, this really sounds like an early uh real-time strategy game yeah dude it's it's the general idea of what real-time strategy would be and yeah, because you're playing together, you have a map that you can do stuff to, and you have little critters that you can order around. Dude, it's going to get closer to it. Let's hear a quote from Glenn Corpse about this, where there were severe limitations to the amount of flat land my generator created, and the tools to modify the landscape were cool for creating more. The way Peter's settlement code exploited this resource was a work of genius. I am a firm believer that in the idea of that technical limitations are often a good thing rather than a problem. And he was like, dude, we, we, we have a problem. And now, now we have to solve this somehow. And this creates something better. This makes the game better. This was everything before was just solving a problem and creating features by accident. And now they have the same problem. They had too many people on the screen. So they had to find a problem, um, a solution for that. And what they did, because they had to get rid of people on the screen, is they implemented that if people came onto a plain square, onto a plain block on the map, they would turn into a house. So they wouldn't okay. move around anymore. That would save like um calculation um like like processing from the computer so, so it was like they were settling that square yeah they were building a little settlement and if two people like if, if people met a person from another player they would fight and one would kill the other that would also reduce people and for a while especially glenn and peter they would just play for fun and look what happened and um they were like they would they would drown each other's people try to set up fights in in ways by raising and lowering the land and it got really interesting for them and they were just evening out bugs for hours and hours by just playing this game this game on their amigos and they just had fun playing their own game it was un like they they said that they did an, they did endless testing processes going through this game over and over again and i think we heard that before from other game developers they were always like you got to play your game you got to play it over and over again to figure out why is my game fun what's fun about right. this what's not working and they also they also came to that. They figured out what's fun about it and what's not working. And they always felt this kind of frustration with it because one thing that was still not working is the player couldn't really influence the people. They were still just following the step mechanic. You couldn't tell them where to go. They just go wherever the step count would tell them to go. Or you could just remove all the land, but that would just make them bug out against the ocean. And they had the necessity to create a way to truly influence the people it kind of felt like it led nowhere. So here's a quote by, by Les Edgar about this. Where you have a game that is indirectly controlled, you can only influence gameplay rather than directly determine it. The issue is that you cannot force the two opposing factions to fight very easily. I came up with the idea of the papal magnet. This enabled you to direct your followers to a specific destination in the world. Once they arrived, the AI took over, and if there was an opposing faction nearby, they would fight. 
you use this to colonize the map and to engage the opposite side when you felt you had sufficient followers. So this paper magnet looked like an Ankh, like the um, ancient Egyptian holy symbol. Right. And you could put it on the map. And a cross with a circle on the top for yeah. those who don't know what an Ankh looks like. Yeah. And you could put it on the map and it kind of it overruled the step count mechanic. It was just like a movement order in a real-time strategy game. You, you'd put it somewhere and all your um, people would just decide, I will, go, I will go to the Ankh now. And this was really, this is actually a, a big chunk of what real-time strategy games would later on turn into. So this was also revolutionary for the time. So right. after collecting all of your people at these papal magnets, you could turn the paper magnet off and they would spread out again following the step count. But if there was lots of plain areas around, they would build lots of houses. So you had a little village. Almost. Right. So in that way, you could tell, you could essentially tell your, your villagers where to go and build things at. Yeah, because before you, they would just spread out randomly and you'd have houses spread out all over the map. It wouldn't really look like a real city. And now you could make these little focused spots of power where, where you could um, have your followers be. And instead of just building random houses all over the map, but they were still not happy with how the game works. Something was still missing. And they thought about what could happen on such landscapes. To, to further influence the game, to make it more exciting. And the answer was, I mean, we have landscapes and we have people. Why don't we, like, what would be cool would be putting in natural disasters using power. And that's the antel again, right? The antel, you're the powerful thing watching from above and um, bringing destruction upon these tiny creatures. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this out there. You don't have to tell me. Is this like the beginning of Sim? That's my guess, like the Sim games? That's that would be where I so would sim games go. were developed at the same time, but really not the same thing. It's not the same thing. But they, the, okay. the two guys, Peter and the guy that made the sim games, give me a second. I know his name. I wrote it up because it's important for this. Um, his name is Will White. He made them. Ah, uh, and I seem to remember there being a game like what you're describing on the PlayStation One, but I'm not sure, and I never played it. It was a PS One game as well. Yeah. Mm, okay. Cool. Okay. I think I think I'm visualizing what this was then, but continue. Uh, natural disasters. So yeah, they, they thought like maybe natural disasters would be a good thing to implement here. And what they did, like they thought of volcano eruptions, swamps appearing, flooding, earthquakes, all this cool stuff. You could like like something as a kid, you would also fantasize about to be able to cast earthquakes over the land to just destroy everything. And they wanted to mix all of these things into the game and give the player the ability to call upon them. But as they tried that out, they kind of animated it and figured out like functions to make that possible. They noticed how the ability, ability to cast infinite volcanoes um, to destroy everything grew dull rather quickly. Like it was, it, it, it was just too much. And yeah, that it, doesn't sound fun without some kind of limitations. Yeah, it actually made the game less fun. Um, so they had to they, they had to find an in-game currency to limit the use of disasters. So they would have to use it strategically. Strategically, what do you think the in-game currency was? What's always the in-game currency for things you do? Mana. It was it, it was mana. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and they they implemented mana into the game. Man, for those of you who don't know what mana is, mana is the generalized term for magical energy for some reason in, in, yep. in video games. Um, I need mana is something you can just say and people will understand what you mean in a vague kind of way. Assuming that you know anything about video games, uh, I won't divulge too much here because it would give away perhaps, really, perhaps some personal information I shouldn't dig too far into, but I was part of a club at one point that had the word mana in its name and it was like um it was like an rpg kind of thing i won't get into where or why and someone walked by one time and was like mana you mean like what fell from the heavens in the bible and i was like no <laughs> they chose this game currency um because mana. they knew they yes. had to they had to find a currency to limit the uses of the natural disasters for each player because otherwise it just would get dull and but they also had to find a way to gain it 
you had to have to somehow generate this mana and it would be generated by pe by the people but only if there were a house not if they were walking around so you they already implemented that a house could grow bigger and smaller depending on the people it consisted of so they just added that a bigger house would generate more mana so all of a sudden you had to strategize if you wanted to explore the map and fight or generate mana and according to Peter, this flipped their newly found feature to cast disasters into a contest of strategy. Right. Which is really cool. All of a sudden, like the all the whole real-time simulation thing, um, real-time strategy game thing, it called it came closer and closer. But there there was still no end game. Um, the multiplayer games they would last for hours. And we too know this. We kind of we, we made a board game once, remember that? And you remember how the first yep. games we played they lasted they lasted about four hours. And it would be disgusting because it would just not end. You could not tip over the balance of the game. Right. It was just a back and forth and back and forth until we realized we needed balancing mechanics. Yeah. And they solved this by implementing two things. The first thing is that the papal magnet, the thing that would attract the people, would not just be an ank that you'd put somewhere. It would be a knight that could walk around like an avatar of yourself and okay. could fight and attract people. It would kind of be your, your army leader. And so that, that would, was a source of power that would um, speed fighting up. But also there would be an, a spell that would be the most expensive spell of them all that would be called the Armageddon spell. And if you'd cast the Armageddon spell, all the people on the map would be raised up and put into the same spot and they'd have to fight it out. They, they, oh. They, yeah. The, the, all, everybody would be stuck together and whoever had the strongest army at that point in the game, they'd just win because they'd just beat up all the other players. It would be a, a, like a final brawl until it just one side remained well that's a really cool idea yeah and this finished the game this was the complete mechanic they needed to add like they added more fluff and padding that's what peter said everything that came after this just made it prettier which was important but the core mechanic was just this nothing else it was the landscape the moving around the, the casting the disasters and um, the little twerks they did again with gaining currency strategizing about how to how to how to fight and and when to generate mana and this is how they created a, a strategy game and you know if you create a strategy game like there is so many but the hardest thing about it like a game like chess is to make it balanced in a way that it still ends and and that's a huge problem in creating balanced strategy games is make them fun because there's a winner in the end and not just because they last forever well i would say that wouldn't there be inherent balance in the fact that both players had access to the same things? So like I'm thinking of like StarCraft, right? In StarCraft, someone could be Terran and someone could be Protoss and they have access to two totally different things. And so that makes balance harder. But if it's just StarCraft is everybody is playing Terran and they have to decide what they're going to pick, you know, what units they take, there's balance within not having different factions. I would think that would be easier. Yeah, too. But that was, when did StarCraft come out? Seven years later? Eight oh, years later? 90, uh, uh, 95? Yeah. So 94 or 95, I think. Eight years guess. later. The, that was it. That, right. Th so you're right. This, this was um, how strategy games would um, evolve, but they weren't there yet. They didn't exist yet. And, and this is something we were going to get into now, because while, while they created the game, they they actually had to get into publishing too because they were they knew they were getting close to finishing the game and they kind of had to get a publisher because peter was kind of burned out on self-publishing as we know because only, right. yeah and so they had to get a publisher someone else to do it for them someone that knew how to do it and edgar that's edgar while the other two did a lot of the development work edgar went out to find a publisher and the problem was at the time that publishers had no interest in anything that wasn't a shooter or a jump and run game. That was just the, the two genres that existed. Um, How interesting. And shooter not in the, um, not meaning a, a first person shooter, but also the, the side scrollers with the spaceship and games like that, or games that were basically clones of Space Invader or improvements on Space Invader or stuff like that. That was games that publishers were like, this existed before, we're going to sell this again because we sold it before. And they were just looking for stuff like that. 
and Peter states quite cynically and that they that one response that they got was if you get them to shoot each other we might take it hmm. and I think this says less about publishing culture even though originality kind of always has a hard time getting published but it says more about how frustrated they must have been with not getting their game onto the market because it was like man we put a lot of time into this and they don't even look at it this must have been a rough time for them sure and i imagine that much like much like things are now although it's easier in some ways self-publishing would be pretty difficult yeah right um so at some point they went to a publisher that was rather new to europe uh it was 1989 now it was electronic arts Ah, yeah, and inside you're already mm -hmm. going like, oh, this is not gonna go well. Yeah, let's see about this. Okay, um, they met with electronic Hello, arts. darkness, my old friend. <laughs> and they, the big EA, right? And apparently EA wasn't really interested either, but they had to fill a hole in their publishing schedule. So they got a deal because they were in the right place at the right time. Luck again, right? Mm, right. God. Or so they believed. They signed up with EA. And this is where Peter states that he has huge regrets because even though he loved video game development, he felt like he was a terrible contract negotiator. And this whole show that EA made up, for him, it was just a show to make them feel like they are unwanted and they wouldn't negotiate as much about their contracts. And he said that EA smelled how unable he was to negotiate a good contract from a mile away. They wanted to abuse it from the start. So Peter, while he was at the contract negotiation after Edgar kind of figured it out, he is a self-proclaimed chain smoker. And, okay. and you usually can tell when someone smokes a lot. And Peter claims that EA, they noticed that and they kept him in the conference room for as long as possible until he got cravings. That's his big conspiracy theory. So, so he okay. he'd go crazy. And so he just, and when they got to, to royalties, he just, he just wanted to get out in any way possible just to get a, a cigarette. I mean, it sounds a bit like a conspiracy, but I think if anyone would put it, pull it off, it would be EA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so part of me wants to think that that's like unbelievable, like, like, you know, dude, maybe you just needed a cigarette and that contract negotiations for video games probably take a while, right? But on the other hand, I think that we can't discount the possibility that there were some savvy lawyers who knew that they could leverage this against him. So who knows, yeah. but... Yeah, so yeah, I think too, it might have been a lot of Peter's cynicism um, speaking, but... He he was he he seems to still like I, I saw interviews from him from from like five years ago and he still seems to be frustrated about that. Hmm. So it came to royalty negotiation and they got a deal where they got no upfront funding and they got they would get ten percent of the earnings of the game and that would rise to twelve point five percent if they sold a million units. So I have a quick question. I don't think we actually talked about this yet. What did they call this game? Oh, we'll get into that. But okay. um, I, I mean, I can say it now. So, so um, I, let, let's, let's talk about how it looked like for a second. So you had this map and around it, it looked like there was a sorcerer's book in the back with all the buttons on it. It looked really pretty, like pixel art. And then there was underneath the map, um, there was all the buttons you could use because you could play the game entirely with your mouse. And so you, you'd click these buttons that either that move the map around. You had to have this big map on the little book that was the, um, on the upper part of the screen. And you have the, the zoomed in map on like a, a scroll in front of you. And it looked really nice, like you were a sorcerer that was sitting in front of a table controlling um, puny humans in his realm um and yeah you had, for each spell you had a little button and there, and there was a little bar in the top right with for the mana you had and they called the game populous hmm. uh and populous was um the name which means um i think populous i don't know how to translate it differently but just i, th I guess a lot of people would be yeah. translation for it yeah that would be fine yeah yeah, and because that's what it was about, about having a lot of people, because usually if you had a lot of people, you'd win the game. So yeah, that was the game. 
And so, yeah, they got into these royalty negotiations where they got a deal of 10 to 12.5%. And I was really unsure about, is that a lot? Isn't that a lot? Is that is that a good royalty deal? So I did a really unreliable Google search about sure. what's a good royalty deal. And I read, I found this guy called Peter Oliver, who's kind of, he has this consulting agency for game developers. And he says that usually royalty deals go from 20 to 50 percent. Oh, wow. And okay. there often is advance pay, but, but advance pay always gets subtracted from, from your royalties. So, okay. so, so that they didn't get upfront, upfront funding is kind of okay, but that they only got 10 to 12 percent was a huge ripoff. And it sounds like it. They, they didn't even get half of what they deserved. And although I would note, again, you know, we, we asked our unreliable friend, Professor Google, uh, I wonder if those were standard at the, like closer to the standard at the time. Yeah, I actually, he actually, like in that article, he actually mentioned that during the 90s, lots of these veteran developers got completely burned out by deals with these big publishing firms because they because okay. during that time it was actually typical to get deals like peter got and but they were but they were still considered disgusting deals at the time but this deal is worse we'll see it later than it seems okay. from above but there's apparently there still is bad blood between all these old developers and these big publishers that still exist, especially EA. EA has has left has left a lot of burned ground between right. developers and themselves by doing deals like that. So yeah, I I would say Peter probably is right about that. He he got scammed a bit, but it will get a bit worse about how much he got scammed. But he didn't know at the time, so let's leave that in the dark for now. They were like, at least we're published. It was so hard to get a publisher anyway. Nobody wanted to publish us. So EA kind of gets their game and they start to test it thoroughly. They, and during the time, testing was done differently than it is today. And today, testing takes months and it's like a well-structured process. Back in the day, apparently, there was only a 24-hour testing period. Oh my gosh, but, that's so minimal. <laughs> but what, what Populous was, like by now, it wasn't only multiplayer, but they, they implemented like an AI that could play an enemy player. And so there was different scenarios that you could go through and you could do a single player campaign that would have 500 levels. That's a lot. A single single player campaign that has 500 levels. And the the testers, they kind of got into it like for two hours and then they called them up and were like, yeah, these these levels, they, they seem to check out. They probably played like five or six levels or something. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and they were like, could you just give us the cheat code so we could see if the, like, we don't need to test all of these 500 levels. Can you just, just give us the cheat code so we can get to the end sequence so we can check that the end sequence works? And this is when the Bullfrog team realized that while developing all of these cool things, for the game, they they kind of forgot something. Though we didn't we didn't write an end for the game. There was, oh no! <laughs> there was no ending, and they were like, yeah, "Oh no!" Yeah, sure. We're gonna we're gonna send you a version with the cheat code for the end sequence in two hours. <laughs> 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 so they, they sat down. <laughs> they had to. They were like, "We gotta figure out how this game is gonna end." <laughs> In between each of the scenarios, there would be something they called the Goblin King. It, it, it was this little head that showed up with pointy ears, and the, it, okay. it would judge your performance. And they would take the Goblin King, just the face of him, that also appeared between every level, and they'd just take him and they'd animate him. And his one eyebrow would rise three pixels, <laughs> and, he, and then it would say, well done, mortal. And that's it. <laughs> Ending sequence. And they shipped it to them, gave them a cheat code, and pretended like it was always in the game. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Wow. Simpler times. Simpler times. So yeah, they made it in a few hours. And now Populous was, after testing was done, like, they didn't really test it. They just played 10 levels and then checked off the ending. And there probably was a ton of bugs in all of the levels, but nobody cared. But now 
Populous was heading towards release, so the Bullfrog guys had to do something they didn't have to do before. It was like an entire new world of video game development, and that is the, the press work. You have to talk to, to interviewers, to reporters, to magazines and stuff like that. Well, that sounds like that would be great for Peter and Les because they were just salesmen through and through. Yeah, I mean, that's what you would think, right? But Peter, he was a huge gaming fan, and he had this one magazine he'd always read, which was called Ace. And now he had an interview lined up with a reporter from Ace, and he says he was dying inside because he made this game, and he had mm -hmm. so much pressure on himself. Is this was going to be good? And they knew this was this magazine that he listened to, like he's his heroes about video games. They would judge his game and that would determine oh. everything and you know peter had made a few mistakes in his life before that ended in big disappointment so <laughs> peter was insanely nervous for this interview and he was nervous for what the journalist might think of him and his game so peter has you, we know peter's approach to stress right they go to drummond's pub <laughs> and so sure and so, get plastered and so they, he invited the reporter to drummond's pub and they went oh there. my gosh <laughs> they went there at 10 a.m in the morning and they stayed until 4 p.m and 4 p.m was when according to peter he was hugging the toilet bowl because the 14 pints of beer he drank would come out of him again and they talked about nothing that was even related to video games they just got plastered in the in the pub. what <laughs> yes <laughs> 14 pints 14 pints these were, oh my god these were englishmen in the 90s so they knew how to drink <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> ever seen train spotting? I mean, no, no. <laughs> gonna... But I know, I know the general gist of train spotting. <laughs> yeah, man, that's about it. So, <laughs> when he was that drunk, he found the courage to actually ask the reporter if he if he liked the game, if he liked Populous. And now imagine you spend the entire afternoon with some dude in a pub, and you're both entirely drunk. Will you get an honest answer? I don't know. Probably yes. Um, and the ace reporter said that they loved populous and that it was the best game that they ever played in their entire life wow and peter could not believe it he was like this guy must have the drunk lovey goggles on he must be like sure he just wants like he's just lonely and wants to be my friend or something i don't know he, <laughs> he just saying things he liked me but since they were in dominus pub peter was like we can just go to the office and just play the game and the reporter was like yes let's do it i challenge you to a multiplayer game and uh, oh man and peter was like yeah we can fight this out and, <laughs> and they'd, they'd go out of the pub and and this is Peter knew like if they do this he'll truly know inside of himself is his if his game was like this was his chance to figure out if he created something worthy, and they never reached the office because they fell asleep in an alleyway. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> but apparently they got a pretty good score in the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> so you know there are parts of this game that i think are forgettable like all of it because i never played it but you know the guy who made it's pretty cool and we had a few points so yeah you know, like eight and a half out of ten <laughs> <laughs> yeah i love this guy so much oh. researching this is so fun. <laughs> So okay, Populous, Jesus Christ. Populous hits the market oh. now. Uh, they've got a bunch of good scores in magazines. And now comes a bit of a tricky part, which will show how EA screwed them over a bit more than we, we, we know for now. And so it's March 1989. It's a huge hit. The game sold in total 4 million units until today. Until today. But in 1989... It was one third of the entire profit of EA. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was the biggest game in that year. And it was still one of the best seller, top 10 best selling te games of all time. And it was ported to every system you could imagine. It was on DOS, it was on Game Boy, the Sega Master, the Genesis, the Mac. And it, like, it, it was everywhere. It was one of the best games that came to the Mac because something like that didn't exist before. 
It was a completely new genre that has not been made before. So David Gardner, that was currently the CEO, CEO of EA, they, he called Peter Molyneux and he called him like, yo, Peter, uh, I'm sitting in front of this mountain of money that you made for us. Uh, we're, we're both millionaires now. I think you, you made of both millionaires. And Peter in the interview says that at that point, he already thought like, oh, I think I made you a millionaire. And mm -hmm. he was really thinking because Peter wasn't getting any money. No money was showing right. up. It was three months into, into release. And for some reason, money wasn't showing up. And he was like, oh. how is this? How, how, how are we not getting paid for this? And it would actually last nine months until they got paid, like nearly a year. And wow. he had a mortgage. He, he was close to having to move. He was, man was completely broke. He did not know what to do. And that was because the EA built a clause into the contract that said that they could delay the payment for nine months if they wanted to. So of course they did that. Wow. So they just paid them nothing for nine months and just kept the revenue and <sighs> it up. In Good old EA. Just new EA is just like the old EA. You know, I'm glad that EA has kept brand consistency for decades. Absolutely. You know, when you look at EA, you know, that's a gaming company that'll fuck you. <laughs> yes, yes. They stayed truthful to themselves. They swoop right in. They go, hey, do you remember how you really liked Mass Effect? Yeah, we did too. You know what we like too? Money. We like lots of yeah. money. Bullfrog will be one of the companies that will go into EA's graveyard. Mm, yep. And But we're not there yet. Um, they, Bullfrog will make a few more games, but still... Populous was the masterpiece that they created. And they always yearned to create things similar to it. But what I noticed while researching this was that all the games that Bullfrog made, they followed me through my entire childhood. I played games by them without knowing that Peter Molyneux was behind all of them. And so basically researching this was for me kind of meeting an old friend that you didn't know. That was pretty cool. I like that. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. So even though they got scammed, after a while they got a lot of money, they could get back into into making games. And the most important thing is this launched them into the gaming industry immediately. Now they were established game developers because there was no such thing as a sim like simulation games weren't a big thing yet. It, it was not um, about at the same time sim city came out by will Wright, mm -hmm. and will Wright and peter molyneux they talked at some point and they often talked about that they were the pioneers of simulation creation because molyneux created this genre that populous was that would be called a god simulation because you would look at it mm. above and it's kind of like an rts but it's less about warfare and more about influencing the land and Will Wright created this city simulation, this create a city, um, make it work out, balance everything out, and just watch the game unfold itself, watching a game play itself as kind of an interesting thing. And that they kind of they how pushed that into the market and how hard it was to establish themselves as simulation makers. And the, I mean, the simulation is one of the biggest genres that exists now. It's, yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. both of us, we play tons of simulation games because yeah. it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean, I think of even things like Stellaris, yeah. right? Like Stellaris is a real, it, I would consider it a real-time strategy game, but a lot of it is just letting your empire go and sit and just advance. And you've made decisions and you sort of have to see how they turn out, I, right? Like, obviously, there's the ship aspect of move around and explore and pick which planet to colonize or whatever. But you kind of, there's only so many choices you make and then you sort of have to let things go. I bet that the Paradox guys were greatly influenced by the work of Will Wright from Maxis and Peter Molyneux from Bullfrog because these guys, they they stamped this genre out. Right. Well, like you mentioned earlier, the iteration of art, yeah, right? Even if they weren't directly influenced, you know, you can see those threads there. Totally. So, yeah, they, they went on to make a few more games to just get into what happens to the people after Populous um, came out. They made two more parts for Populous. It's Populous 2, Trials of the Olympian Gods, which was kind of like 
populous but far more complicated um, so it was not as good as well received also during that time second parts of something were kind of frowned upon it was like you're making a second part of your game have you i don't know have you lost ideas or something and right then they made populous the beginning which was the populous version i played the most with my friends when i was a kid was that one on the ps1 yeah that was on the ps1 okay. i had for the ps1 too but the entire concept of being a godlike player it goes through all of bullfrog's games and even further than that because molyneux left after 1995 and made his own company and even then he kept doing that so they made it, it's always the same concept with them be a god watch things from above influence the land influence the people gain power by acquiring more people but sometimes like the role of the god kind of switched into being a leader of a company for example entrepreneur again but like reiterated right he finally <laughs> did it he finally did it entrepreneur 2 god simulator no. fuck yes peter i'm so happy for you <laughs> okay so a game like they one for example <laughs> theme park you know these theme park yeah, games yeah. where you would build a theme park mm -hmm. peter wanted you invented those bullfrog that was, really that was a Peter Molyneux invention, looking at it from, like, just think about it. You are the theme park owner. You watch things from above. You influence the park. You influence the people. You gain money by attracting more people. It's the same concept of populace, nothing else. And the people just also, they, they follow this weird step count AI that is probably implemented into it. Then what they also did, I don't know if you know the game, but Dungeon Keeper was one, a Dungeon Keeper. Was one of the game that I played the most as a kid. And Dungeon Keeper, Peter Molyneux game, same concept. Wow. Be a demon overlord, watch things from above, influence the land, influence the demons, gain power by acquiring more demons. It's same thing. Same, they also did the Magic Carpet series. Uh, it's like, be a magic carpet, watch things from above, influence the I wish. <laughs> I wish I gained power from acquiring my demons. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> if only. Then you know maybe the the theme hospital games that mm -hmm. would, um i think there's a clone out in the market right like like two years ago it started it's like something something oh. hospital i don't remember it but it's it... oh i can find out um 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 oh shit i know what it something is hold on point hospital two point hospital, two point hospital. that is basic two point hospital just... i remember quads Quad's wife was into that yeah. for a while and was playing it on her it's stream. It's just a clone yeah. of what Theme Hospital was, what's also made right. by Peter Molyneux. Same thing. You're the hospital owner. You look at it from above. You influence the staff. Same thing. And there's always people that run around in random fashion. It's always, it's always the anthill you watch, you watch from above. It's, it's still that same pattern. And I really love that. That Because I, I didn't notice that before because I knew a lot of Bullfrog games and I... I I never knew why I liked them the same. And it's always because it's always the, it, the iteration of the same idea that was started in Populous. And I find this so cool. And when I made this episode, I actually wanted to make an episode about another game that is called Black and White. Mm, oh, we've talked about this. Dude, I love Black and like when, when I was a kid, Black and White was the game I wanted to have. It wasn't it was in my mind or it existed. It was like, what if my hand was all powerful and I could raise a mountain? And when Peter Molyneux left Bullfrog because he got tired of EA, he created a company called Lionhead. And at Lionhead, he made he iterated Populous again, but with super neat graphics in 2001. And now you were this, there was this whole concept of good and evil. And there was these 3D animated people, like real 3D. You could even zoom in and move around them. And you had this huge avatar creature that could do things. And you could throw stuff. There was physics. It was such a great game. Black and White is the game that has a place in my heart, just as Dungeon Keeper, just as Populous. This man created one of the most important games for me and i learned this by researching this episode and this is hyper cool that's really neat yeah. um so when i was thinking earlier on about what this could be as you were talking i was thinking either a it was the sim games or b it was in my head that ps1 game that i know docs used to play all the time because you and i had talked about black and white like multiple times um back when we first met up yeah. back when we were talking about like games we used to play and i remember one of the things, so a little bit of our backstory here, one of the things that we used to chat about was the game Croc, Legend of the Gobos oh, yeah. from the PS1. And we started talking about 
other games from that era and i remember black and white coming up yeah black and white is a really neat game people nowadays say that it was overhyped but i disagree i think it's a good game but people like to say that i don't know yeah people like to say that about anything yeah. Ugh, that codex rex podcast is overhyped <laughs> <laughs> just a couple of dudes talking about video games how fucking novel yeah. so i think one last thing i'd like to get into is that how neat it is how this all started right how peter lied about being, about being, about not being a bean exporter <laughs> and thereby getting 10 amiga consoles and thereby like this is what fascinates me the most thereby creating some of the most influential games how insane is that that's it. like Oh my gosh, what a surreal experience that had to be to walk in and have that moment where you're like, my life could go in two different directions right now. Yeah. <laughs> right? Exporting more beans or I don't know whatever that will be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good that it, I think it's, it's great that it shows the uncertain path. Yeah. And I mean, you know, there's a little bit of dishonesty there, but also like when fortune comes knocking, man. You know, you just have to take it. Yeah, it's, I don't know. Yeah. I got to, I got to mention a few more people because there was more people at Bullfrog, but for some reason, Glenn and Edgar and Peter never talk about them. I don't know why. Maybe they joined later. It, it's never mentioned. Um, but okay. Bullfrog consisted of more people than Glenn and Peter and Edgar. Um, there was also Kevin Donkins, who was a programmer. There was Andy Jones as a graphic designer and Dave Hanlon as a musician. And there was Sean Cooper, who was also a graphic designer. Just like they influenced what Bullfrog was going to be. Bullfrog had huge growth after they, after they released Populous and they hired a lot of people. It turned into a huge company that always developed several games at the same time simultaneously it's pretty cool um so how, what ended up happening to bullfrog other than like we mentioned that they went into ea's ea's graveyard but like what how, when did they stop making games because yeah. he left in 1995 yeah. so when did they fold so if during know? 1995 they were developing dungeon keeper and okay ea wanted to rush things and wanted to, to pull it out fast ea yeah electronic arts wanted to rush a game can you imagine that yeah. And Peter decided to, to, he sold Bullfrog to EA entirely, but he took Dungeon Keeper with him and he finished it oh. in his own time in his own house with his own people. He just invited all of them to his house and they finished it there without, without EA. And he actually says that Dungeon Keeper is one of the games that he regrets the most because of that. He like when he looks at that game, he feels a lot of pain towards it because it feels like it it sums up all of the frustration he has towards EA. Even though I think Dungeon Keeper is one of the best games I've ever played, but hmm. that's I, I find that pretty interesting. And what they did is I think they tried to make Dungeon Keeper three and then for some reason just canceled it. It never came out. It was, they actually announced it and then just didn't do it. Now there's new Dungeon Keeper clones that kind of reiterate the story right. of Dungeon Keeper. They made Dungeon Keeper 2, which I didn't like as much. Then they just died. They, they were just shot in the back of the head by the big EA guys. <laughs> and uh, all of them spread out into the wind and created their own companies. Um, yeah. Funny, fun thing about Les Edgar, all of them are still in the gaming industry, except for Les Edgar. He left for the automotive industry. He's a car. Oh, really? He's a car racing guy now. He, he works for Aston Martin. <laughs> what? I was like, okay. What's this guy doing? What? How's, how did? Okay. And and he there's lots of pictures of him where he stands in front of sports cars with pretty women. <laughs> it's pretty really funny. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. What's what's your take on on Bullfrog? That's so that's really fascinating to me. And you know we've had so there's a few there's a few threads that stick out here that I, I find interesting just from a macro scale. One. I really like hearing these stories that are like, we hit a technical limitation. How do we mess with that? Yeah. And then once they figured out how to exceed that technical limitation, some of those things ended up becoming core parts of the game, right? So like, not to keep referencing previous episodes, but like Crash Bandicoot, that, that whole 
game was basically put together in ways that they weren't even allowed to do. And they made it look beautiful by surpassing these technical limitations uh, that the PlayStation could use. So when I hear about them going, well, we hit a programming wall that we didn't know how to fix and suddenly it ended up becoming integral to our game. Like that's really cool to me. Absolutely. Um, Also what I find fascinating is just, you really stress this as well, but just how lucky they were (laughs) like just what random chance led to a bean salesman making some of the most fantastic games ever made you know yeah. so that's that's really cool to me and I'm, I'm really happy that you that you told me this story today yeah i was glad to tell it one thing um i i heard an interview by peter from from 2006 where he did a long talk at the gdc the um i think it's the game developers conference in san francisco yep and he's still working on populous one he's still iterating it because he made a version of it that you can play with 250 people simultaneously. What? <laughs> yes, on a, on a monstrous map. He's not allowed to publish it because EA owns the rights to it. But he but he showed it off during this conference. It's pretty funny. Uh, wow. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, that would be rough to get 250 people together when you're not allowed to release the game. Yeah, I think he's just doing it out of nostalgia reasons or something. <laughs> sure, sure. Let's, let, That's cool. Let's talk about sources for a second. So I, I watched okay. a huge um, talk he did, at the at Peter did at the GDC. I read an article about Peter Molyneux from 2000 by the Wired magazine that was archived in the, in the Internet Archive. I read an interview with Glenn Corpse and Les Edgar from 2009 where they talked about making populace. I read an article on Moby Games, which is kind of like the IMDb of video games. It has like names of all the people that are important in the video game industry. I read an article from, and actually from September of 1989, just five months after um, Populous released. And it was like, a, like it's, it's a saved up old version in some internet archive magazine, like wow. gaming magazine. It was called The One. And it had all these cringy nine early 90s like proto 90s advertisements of, of video games mixed in yeah. with because people didn't know how to do video game magazines yet completely so there was these weird advertisements in between like uh also buy perfume and here, yeah. here's a nice car uh because we have not understood that these are not read by people that are into cars <laughs> i don't know yeah All right it was it, it, pretty pretty nice to see something like that and i also um, used an article by now gamer from 2012 that wrote generally about how both productions came to be and how they turned into one of the most legendary uk developers there ever were they actually got a prize from tony blair to be one oh, really? of really um, not a real prize, but he he credited them as being one of the brands that um, are connected to to Britain, as being being what Britain is best in exporting, and that is video game software. By both, huh. yeah. How interesting. <clears throat> well, thanks for that, man. I really appreciate this, and I appreciate you um, uh, talking about a game that meant a lot to you yeah. when you were a kid. So. I think I think we're good, right? I think too. I think we got to thank a few people, though. I think we should yeah. thank um, still Quad Laser because we still use his music, and that is pretty cool. We mm-hmm. have to thank our community because it's nice to hang out with them, and some of them will listen to this. And thanks to you guys for being here. And yeah, it really means a lot. Uh, uh, what what else? Um, thank you, Docs. Oh, thank you, Tyler. <laughs> thank you for for staying at home and being able to do this again. It's really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, friends. Well, thanks for listening. We'll be back with another episode soon, TM. (laughs) And uh, who knows when that will be. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Yes, take care and have a good day. Yeah, stay safe out there. Bye.